We continue our exploration of the question, do Christians who are sealed in the Holy Spirit, guaranteed unto the day of salvation, whereby we cry, Abba, Father, um, do Christians have a sin nature? In some sense, you could argue is... um, and interesting, the word confusion, if you look up the etymology of the word confusion, it means a mixture. Um, and so it's like you get a mixture, a swirling of these things, and it's like, well, you know, which one is it? Like, do Christians have a sin nature? Are they a mixture of the old and the new? Um, of course, it would be would be wonderful if we were just new, and that were all there was to say about it. Um, the fact that we still, our bodies still die is um, a pretty good evidence of the fact that we are not completely new. All of the curses that are listed in Genesis chapter 3 still happen. Women have um, pains in pregnancy. Uh, sometimes people, a la um, Bethel and company, some hyper-charismatic folks or some dominionist folks, teach that all of the curses have been completed in Christ. And so, you know, of course, why, why do children still die? Why do Christians still die? Why do women still have uh, pangs in pregnancy? Why do men still have trouble farming the earth and we need hyper technology and like genetically modified things in order to to mitigate this if the curse has been mitigated, right? I mean, obvious. I mean, obviously it hasn't. I mean, come on, but it just has to open up their eyes. Um, so we, the last video we examined, kind of exhaustively. Romans chapter 7, and I think that a good summary of Romans chapter 6, 7, and 8 is that in 6, we're free in Christ, we're new. In 7, but we still have a sin nature. Um, Oh, wretched man, who will set me free, right? As Paul says, I think, in the second to last verse. And then Romans chapter 8, the way that we are free is because we set our mind on the things of the Holy Spirit and not the things of the flesh. If we don't have the flesh, then how can we set our mind on something that we don't have? It's like, don't, don't walk on Mars. If you can't get to Mars, how can you how can you walk on it? And what's the point of telling you not to walk on it if you can't possibly get there, right? And so you can't set your mind on something that you don't have. But you can set your mind on something you do have. And so this is this is the choice, the struggle that Christians find themselves in today in a world that is hostile, in a culture that is hostile to their faith and their beliefs, is do you set your mind on the old deceitful lust, which promise to make you feel good. They're like a, they like draw you like a wind blowing against you. Like it pushes you in a certain direction. Do you set your mind there, which is kind of like the default as it were, or do you set your mind on the new man, Jesus, the things of the Holy Spirit, the things that please the Holy Spirit. Um, And this is why it's important to read some of the passages such as we're getting ready to read right now, Galatians chapter five and hopefully Colossians chapter three to, to understand some of the the subtleties of the sin nature that we can recognize whenever we're in agreement with the enemy and setting our mind on the things of the flesh so that we can say, no, I don't want to do that. I am going to set my mind on the things of the Holy Spirit. And it's difficult, this, this struggle that's on the inside. Wow, if you can win the battle uh, with your heart... If you can win the battle in your mind, then what what battle can you not win? Ultimately, things are spiritual and not physical. And so you still might not be able to win like an arm wrestling contest or something like that. But if you have self-control over your own person, then you are um, benefiting from God's training that he has given you in order to live in righteousness and peace forever. Um, that's that's a wonderful promise. Uh, that's a promise that all the religionists, all the people who seek after um, religion, they're 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 looking for something that give them wholeness and peace and worth and validation. Um, God says that He will have He will give you peace forever. Um, 
and Isaiah, those who have their minds stayed on me will keep and he will keep in perfect peace. Um, all right, so we're going to um, read um, Galatians chapter 5, starting in verse 1. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you, that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again that every man that is circumcised, that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace." But we, through the Spirit, wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Jesus Christ neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. Ye did run well. Who did hinder ye that ye should not obey the truth? This persuasion cometh not of him that calleth you. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. I have confidence in you through the Lord that you will be none otherwise minded, but he that troubleth you shall bear his judgment whosoever he be. And I, brethren, if I yet preach circumcision, why do I yet suffer persecution? Then is the offense of the cross ceased. I would they were even cut off which trouble you. For, brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. But if ye bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed of one another. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. But if ye be led of the spirit, ye are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murder, drunkenness, revilings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law, and they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. Okay, so let's go through Galatians chapter 5. Um, Stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. If it's not possible for you to be entangled in the yoke of bondage because you're newer than new, right? You're just, you're just a stunningly new creation, end of discussion. Then why in the world does Paul waste, waste his time as an apostle Right, he's charged with with preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God. Why is he wasting his time saying, "Be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage"? I mean, if you're right, if you're true, if your heart is pure, the pure in heart will see God. Right? If if your heart is pure, then how in the world could you be entangled again with the yoke of bondage? Unless it's possible for it to happen, right? Um. Right here um, through um, probably um, maybe verse 10, and whenever Paul is talking about circumcision, he's using that as a reference to the law of Moses, saying that if you're dependent upon the law of Moses to make you right and in right standing with God and pleasing and honoring to God because you're doing all the stuff, right? Um, today we might say the same kind of thing about like you, you go to church every Sunday, or maybe you go to church every time the doors are open, right? Um, you know, you pay your tithe and you serve on this thing and that thing and this trip and that trip, mission trip or whatever. Um, 
It's Christ who saves us. It's Christ who washes us in his blood and seals us with his Holy Spirit. It, that process is one and done and is not, it's not possible for you to do it by uh, following some litany of, of uh, schedule or some such thing. Or it's not possible for you to undo it. Um, because if you can undo it, then you can rob Christ of his supremacy and glory that he won on the cross by taking your sins from you, right? Because part of what you're doing is taking your own sins from your own self by your work of, I did this and I did that. Um, not of works, lest should any man boast, right? As Paul says in Ephesians. Um, so he's, he's asking why the Galatians are agreeing with this kind of uh, legalistic framework of you got to do all this stuff and that's what salvation is. Um, and then he gives us a, uh, a fingerprint, as it were, of understanding how you can know that you're saved because you're agreeing with the things of the Spirit and walking in the Spirit and not walking in the old way. Um, and so, you know, for example, um, the law, verse 14, the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. But if ye bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed of one another. I mean, right, a person who's new and has a pure heart and who's a saint and they're holy, uh, they're a new creation, a creation, right? Um, righteous and just before God. How how would it be that they would be biting and devouring one another? How would it be that they'd be consuming one another? How would it be that they'd not be fulfilling the second great law, which is to love your neighbor as yourself? Right? Jesus said there's two laws, love God and love your neighbor. How would it be that they're not doing that? Right? If, if, you're, if you're completely new and it's just done and that's the end of the story and there's nothing else to say, then why are we not obeying the law, right? And there's a reason why we're not obeying the law because there's a, a, a new freedom that didn't exist before. There's a choice that didn't exist before. The um, old man didn't have the Holy Spirit. All he could rely on in his, is his sense. Sometimes it's called being sensual or being natural um, by Paul. But you can't, you, can't, uh, you can't set your mind on something that you don't have, right? You can't use something that you don't have. If you don't have the Holy Spirit, then you can't possibly operate in the Holy Spirit, can you? Right? Um, but if you have the Holy Spirit, then the possibility exists that you can operate in the Holy Spirit or not, right? Um, God gives us the ability to be able to set our mind on the things of the Holy Spirit. But that doesn't mean that it's just presto changeo done and then therefore every single thing that you ever do for the rest of your life is set your mind on the things of the Holy Spirit. No, there's a war. There's a struggle. There's a difficulty. There's a challenge. Um, verse 16 this I say, then walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. If you don't have the flesh, a.k.a. the old man, a.k.a. the sin nature, a.k.a. the lower nature, a.k.a. the fallen nature. If you don't have that, then how could you fulfill the lust of it? How is it possible to fulfill the lust of something that you don't have, right? And the answer is you do have it in part. And so therefore, it is possible for you to set your mind a la Romans chapter 8, probably one of the most important chapters in all of the New Testament, because it illustrates the struggle that Christians are in. Where do we set our mind? What do we set our mind on? On things that are lovely and admirable and excellent and worthy of praise? Or do we set our mind on uh, ambition, Jesus, pride, self-centeredness, self-devotion, self-sufficiency? Things like that. And so then this verse 17 is just um, perhaps the very best summary in the entire New Testament of the struggle, this enmity that's going on in my heart and in your heart if it is that you are sealed with the Holy Spirit. 
So Galatians 5.17, For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. These are contrary one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. Verse 18, But if ye be led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Right? And so, we cannot possibly be talking about the unsaved person here, because the unsaved person doesn't have the Holy Spirit. Right? And so, you know, the flesh lusteth against the spirit. The flesh is lusting against the spirit that you don't have? I don't think so. The flesh is just running rampant. It's ruling you. Night and day, your lusts and desires and affections and attitudes are just utterly natural to you. It's all you've ever known. And you walk in it night and day and day and night and night and day and day and night. Without exception. It's, it's all that you have. Right, And it feels good to you. It feels natural to you. It feels normal to you. And so it's what you do all day, every day. right? But if you have the Holy Spirit, a.k.a. a person who's saved, then there's a, actually a war going on. The flesh lusteth against the Spirit and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary one to the other because um, the carnal mind is it enmity with God? It cannot fulfill the law of God. It cannot obey God. It doesn't care about God. It doesn't know God. All it cares about is its appetites and its feelings and desires and then doing those to the highest degree possible. Um, but if ye be led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. And this is what we talked about as one of our hermeneutics in Romans chapter 7. That... The way that the law of Moses is fulfilled, the way that we're able to love one another, remember love is a fruit of the Holy Spirit, right? The way that we are able to fulfill the law and to love one another is because of the power of the Holy Spirit who is overcoming the old flesh, the old man, the old sensual carnal nature that we can do the things that are pleasing to God. And then Paul in um, verses 19 through 21 goes through and talks about all these things. Um, I have made a point previously in other videos that many of these things are demonic. Sin, sin ultimately is demonic. Remember, Satan is the tempter. And I just wanted to say um, witchcraft, right? And so that's, that's a, a sort of agreement with the enemy that you are using the authority, you know, be fruitful and multiply and subdue the earth, right? You are using the authority that God gave man over the earth to agree with the devil because he's got sway in the hearts of men. And that's how the devil is able to be the God of this world and the ruler of this world because he has sway in the hearts of men. Right, And so he convinces us, entices us, seduces us, lures us to agree with him in any one of these things. And um, the, the witchcraft promises power and it promises information, which is somef something that we always see with respect to spirits. Is that spirits always, one way or another, are a source of power and information and that's exactly you know so the the power would be you know killing your enemies the information would be like a, a medium or conjuring up spirits of the dead to try and get advice on a decision um, you hear people who believe in pantheism that you know the oracle at delphi rulers in in uh, roman times would go to this oracle and they would make decisions based upon the words that were given there by the priests and priestesses who are speaking by these spirits, right? Um, they are getting information. They are engaged in witchcraft, even if you ask them and say, oh, no, I'm not engaged in witchcraft. I'm seeking God, right? But nonetheless, they're not seeking the real and true God. They're seeking something that claims to be God and um, getting information that's that's helping them to have real world impact because they're using that information to inform decisions that they make. Um, the evil of witchcraft ultimately is that we're not depending upon God for our power. Remember Jesus said, you can do nothing apart from me. 
uh, the Old Testament minor prophet said, not by might or power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. We're not depending upon uh, every, every, um, what did Jesus say in response to the devil? Um, the br- bread of every word, living by every word of God, like depending upon God and being sustained by him and not by any other source. And that other, any other source is by definition idolatry, right? And it becomes witchcraft. And so we contrast these self-serving, self-centered, self-sufficient attitudes, which promise pleasure, it promises benefit in the here and now, um, which Christians are not immune to, right? And we contrast this with the fruit of the Spirit, which is love, joy, long-suffering. Let me tell you something. Sin doesn't want to wait. Sin wants to have its pleasure right now. It doesn't want to wait a long time. Gentleness. Sin is, a lot of times, sin is rash and proud and boastful and uh, violent, sometimes angry. Goodness. Um, you know, the sin nature says how... How am I supposed to build my kingdom when I'm helping out other people? Like, like you do you, and I'll do me, and no one else is looking out for me but me. So I'm going to take care of myself, and, and if you don't take care of yourself, then that's your problem, right? <laughs> what if Christ took that attitude, right? Um, faith, meekness, temperance, uh, which is self-control. Um, people who are ruled by the sin nature, they don't have self-control. They don't know what it means to resist temptation because they never do resist temptation. Or they very rarely do resist temptation, right? Because temptation always promises something wonderful. And so why in the world would you want to resist something wonderful? Of course, we who are believers and who have eyes to see and have been granted repentance by the Holy Spirit and conviction by the Holy Spirit, we recognize that there's more to the story than just... uh, chasing after the Pied Piper because it promises health, wealth, and happiness or some such thing. We recognize that um, sin leads to death and that death ultimately lasts forever and ever and ever. And so we compare forever and ever and ever for the blink of an eye and the vapor um, and the here today and gone tomorrow of this life and recognize, well, it's just not worth it. It doesn't make any sense. It's actually quite the foolish thing to have a lusty pleasure now and then die forever and ever and ever in torment. Like, right, the, the, thing, the scales do not balance at all. Um, if, uh, if we live in the Spirit, let's, uh, let us also walk in the Spirit. And this term walk is different than the one in verse 16. And it has a military connotation, almost like, a, a, like, like you're in step. You're marching in step. And so you can imagine like even all the, the, the communist videos or any kind of military video where you see these soldiers like marching in step down the road, boom, 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 something like that. Like it's a military word. And then, of course, Paul says it again, let us not be desirous of vainglory, provoking one another, envying one another. If we don't have that old man, then how in the world are we going to, Jesus, how in the world are we going to do those things? And the answer is we're not. The righteous do right by definition, right? So in the next video, we will consider um, Colossians chapter 3.